Time for an oil change? Head to Jiffy Lube. We've got you covered. We've also got you covered when it comes to oil changes, thanks to Pennzoil Synthetic Motor Oil, getting you back on the road in a Jiffy. Jiffy Lube. Leave worry behind. Caught Offside with Andrew Gunling and J.J. Devaney. Oh, yes! Caught Offside from the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Andrew Gunling and J.J. Devaney. Oh, man. What's up, brother? Oh, breathe again. Yeah. Boy, something tells me this one might be tough to keep under an hour. This World Cup is absolutely bonkers. I'm actually, and this so fits my personality, I think, for people who listen to this podcast, I'm preemptively sad for when this thing is over. I, I 100%. I, I can see the gaping hole on the horizon that's in my life. Like I'm sad that there's no games tomorrow and Thursday. Premier League transfer news is going to be one hell of a drudge compared to this. I know. I, I, I don't, don't even I don't think know, about it. I don't know what it is. I, I mean, I guess it's a combination of so many things. There have been a lot of goals scored. There have been so many dramatic late goals, controversial decisions, uh, talent really on full display. Interesting. This, this tournament... To me, I really don't think we're getting caught up in the moment saying it because we were critical. I think we were, you know, we were semi-critical of the European Championships two years ago. I, I, this has been one of the most enjoyable tournaments that I think I, I've experienced, and that's saying a lot since my team is not in this. From the dramatic games to just the unpredictable performances from teams we'd written off. Let's be honest. Yeah. To even the ball. I love this ball. The way the ball moves. Everything about this tournament has captured me in the a way. The ball. The ball. Seriously. I, I tried to explain this to a friend. You fr- got the uh, Jabulani right there next to you. Terrible, you- terrible ball. Oh. Terrible ball. All right. And it's the brazuca, actually. Oh, that's so. not the Jabulani. No, it's the brazuca. Oh. Um, I was trying to explain this to a friend today. I can, I can go back in World Cups by the ball. Like I, I remember the 1990 ball, what that looked. USA 94. Euro 2000. I remember tournaments in in the development of the Adidas ball, which is probably weird and nerdy. But everything about this tournament has kind of captured my imagination. It's been so fun, and it certainly did not stop today as the round of 16 has now gone final. Two games today. We'll get to them right now. We'll start. I guess we'll go chronologically here. Sweden won Switzerland nil. Feeling this is going to get the short end of the stick. Perhaps. Perhaps (laughs) it might. But, look, here in some ways it shouldn't. this was a fairly sizable upset for Sweden. And you know what? I was kind of, with this matchup, I was sort of damned if I did, damned if I didn't, either way, because I was critical of Sweden in our group preview somewhat for not having brought Zlatan. I said when... I could, and and I'm saying right now, they have they have proven that wrong. When, and I, but I was also critical in our World Cup preview of Switzerland, saying that I didn't think that they were for real. So no matter who won this game, I was going to look bad one way or another. Uh, I'm kinda, I kind of preferred that it be Sweden. I and wanted so to I'm put my that foot through the TV today when Fox threw, threw back to the studio and Alexi Lalas even mentioned Zlatan's name. Oh, come on, JJ. That's so unfair not, to not even look at that as a storyline. They chose to not bring arguably the greatest player in their country's history. What do you mean they chose? And, he wasn't and, involved in qualifying. But he wanted to return to the team, and they said no. That is a story. And now they're in the quarterfinals. That's not a storyline? Come I, I, on. I, I, you're I, looking for reasons to get on Fox if you're saying that. No, I'm, I'll, I'll, say it it about tw- I'll say it about Twitter, too. The notification comes up on Twitter from a game I've already seen, which is annoying. Sweden advances to the quarterfinal without Zlatan Ibrahimovic. What, what is this? This is just nonsense. Let's look at the team on the merits of what they've done over these games, and they absolutely deserve to be in the quarterfinals. Of course they they've do. Surpri- no one's saying anything they've surprised to the contrary. Me. They've surpri- they- he couldn't play in this team anyway there is no way he could play in this side the way they work the way they almost completely sacrifice the personal and the self for the team ethic look at Emil Forsberg who was the the leader in assists in the Bundesliga two seasons ago this guy has been almost like contracted into a ball of what he can be And, and yeah do I think sometimes he should be let off the leash and could this team do better and then I stop myself no this team is doing fine you know as it is look at Lindelof and Granquist today Massive performances. There is no way this guy could play in this team, and it's lazy narrative to talk about the lion who works for Visa. Well, f- agree on all counts now, but I'm saying if if Fox or whoever isn't mentioning the fact that they're doing this without 
him, then I think that's almost bereft in their duties. I, they have to. They at least have to mention it, JJ. The guy wanted to come back onto the team. They said, no, we don't want you. And now look at them in the quarterfinals. That is a story. I think harping on about it. I've just heard too much Who's about it. Who's harping on? People have said one thing about it, and then they talk about the game. We're four games deep into the championship. They said no to him in, what, April or May? Whenever it was. But the World Cup is now. Oh, for... Of course you would talk about it now. Stop May... faking outrage. I'm You're not faking, faking outrage. I'm, I'm not faking outrage. I'm sick hearing about him. Well, let's talk about the game itself. The first half was really interesting. You know who should be on the ESPN body issue? Oh. Toivonen. Beautiful man. It's a handsome team. There's no question about that. Uh, the first half was interesting to me because there were stretches where it felt like Sweden were doing everything in their power to not score. I mean, they were presented with chances. Marcus Berg... Uh, had a great chance, and it just seemed like they're flailing wildly at the ball. Yeah. It just seemed like they weren't focused, uh, I mean, especially it, in their in their finishing ability. And, and I was wondering if it was going to eventually come back and bite them because Sweden do or not Sweden, Switzerland do have some players like Shakiri, obviously who can who can bite you. I tweeted out at the end exactly that. I thought now in these final moments is the perfect time for Shakiri, absolute blaster of a shot, and you could see it happening. And 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 even like if you look at the chances Jamali had in the first half. Oh, Andrew, it opens up and he just blasted over the bar and it was about the best move that Switzerland managed to put together. And here's, let's say we were wrong, we completely underestimated what Sweden were. We, we knew they would be resolute, but they've found a way to win. And I'm just wondering now, does that goal for Forsberg, even though he didn't hit it that well, it deflected into the net, it almost seems like it should have been an own goal in yes. a way. Yes, it, it should. It, it, because it was a, it was going to be a routine save for the goalkeeper. And this is the tournament of own goals, and it needs to go down as one. <laughs> well, back in the day, those were we called them a deflection. We'd, we'd, we'd note the deflection, but we would give Forsberg the credit. But whatever, the way he drops the shoulder to create a chance. I said this against uh, when I saw him play against Germany, and also a little bit when I saw him play against um, Mexico. He has the ability to give that team what it, let's be honest, Berg and Toivonen and can't do. A little I mean, bit of when, creativity. Right. When's, and, and, and all they need is a little bit because they are so resolute at the back that eventually they're going to wear teams down who won't be able to get through them and they'll have that chance and maybe he's the guy that can take the chance. Yeah. It's just, you know, there were moments in this game today where you thought, like I said, that they were kind of giving it away. Lustig played in a ball. I don't remember who it was for, for Sweden, but... Instead of going down, you know, bringing the head down and maybe going for a diving header, I saw instead that. kind of kicks the leg up and just fl- again flails. Was that Ekdal? Was that Ekdal? It, mi- it might have been. But again, um, that was just a massive breakdown in technique. I honestly don't. I know, I know Stewie Holden said you should he should have thrown his head on it. I think it was curving out a bit, Andrew. It was he t- he was if he was able to take it that well on the volley, he should have been able to put it on net and he couldn't. And again, that's just their problem. They only have Toivonen in possibly. And and Forsberg, who are I mean, Berg is in a drought, an absolute drought. Yes. So so that's all they've got. But the point is, they'll stay in a game long enough with their organization to create that one chance. And and who knows what will happen in the quarterfinal? Yeah. And look, it, it certainly helped them that they had an opponent in Switzerland who's not necessarily ruthless in their own right. Um, it's interesting. The goal that Forsberg did eventually score, uh, and we'll talk about Spain coming up. But when I watched that goal, it might have even been mentioned in the telecast, but I couldn't help but thinking Spain couldn't have done this. And I know, look, Spain did have moments Spain didn't even get where to they, that point. But they, Spain, from, from 20 yards out, couldn't have forced a shot and maybe gotten into deflation. But it I, just seemed like they, there was Sweden was, <laughs> other teams are at least willing to do what Spain ah, no, were totally no, no, no. unwilling ah, to do. Ah, come on. Like, Russia would have had a forest, would have had three more players there. Like, Switzerland do play more open than Russia. Spain would not have got into this and didn't get into the center like that. We'll talk about Spain later. Uh, This for Sweden, they've now won back-to-back World Cup matches for the first time since 1958. You know what that means. They're going to the final? Yep. Well, they did then. It was in Sweden, though. I'm sure that helped them. I'm I'm sure it did. Uh, And for Switzerland, they do go out in the end. Which, and I I don't, again, we we kind of, we talked about this already, and I'm not accusing any Swiss player of not putting it in a round of 16 game. That's not the case with Sweden or a tough team to play against. But the passion and the fire of that second game against Serbia, we haven't seen that Sweden, uh, that Switzerland since. We haven't seen them play like men possessed. And I'm just wondering now, you know, was that their final? Did they expend all their energies in winning that game knowing that they'd go, they'd get, 
I mean, they would have had four points after that, which they did. Yeah, it's unfortunate for them because they haven't been to a quarterfinal since 1954 when they hosted the tournament. And it look, and we keep talking about that side of the bracket, that side of the bracket. But really, when are Switzerland going to face Sweden or a team like that necessarily oh. again in the round of 16? This was a chance for them. They, the fans were deflated. Yeah. Absolutely deflated. And I, look, that team is probably... Look, Barami probably won't be around the next time. Jaha probably will. So will Shakiri. But there's a couple of statesmen that will probably move on. This was a good chance for them, definitely. Yeah, yeah certainly was. And it is a, a chance that they missed. We move from that game to the other. Lordy. Oh, boy. Penalties. When the goal happened for Colombia, I was watching with a few people, and I said, this is it. It's following Can I read the you the text that you sent me? Sure. Because this... I was crestfallen. You were. And we, we'll get into that. We will get into that. Um, yeah, this was the... the te- if they lose... This is from Andrew Gundling, an American man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if they lose, England will simply never recover from this. I said, never. The country will sink beneath the waves. They cannot lose. I will not allow it, says Andy. <laughs> Big old Spursy Andy. Spursy Andy was in full effect today. But you know what? English JJ was in a little bit of effect too because the game ended and immediately said, no, no, you've got to do this, this, and put this together and put this music under it and we got right. to play this. So here it is. Your penalty montage of England exercising my ode to Albion, their demons. You've got to hold and give and do it. The England are out of the World Cup. West Germany are through to the final on penalty kicks. Do you back in the score quickly? Yes or no? Yes. Only oh, Hatton. No. Argentina go through and England go out. It's awaiting over here for Portugal. It is. Portugal are World Cup semi finalists, and England, as usual, lose on a penalty shootout. Tyre, can he make a catch? Yes! It's a nervous one. Um, I've never really been in a situation like that before, but. Uh, I felt like I had to score after the header I missed at the end there, so uh, I'm thankful I scored that one. Demons exercised. They had been 0-3 in World Cup penalty shootouts before. That was the most for any country who had been in three or more to not have a win. We're not even talking about European Championship defeats. Where they were 1-4, for right? I believe England are 1-7 for in major tournament penalty shootouts. Um... And then today happened, and now they are two for eight. Uh, I didn't think it was going to go that way, especially, I mean, obviously when Jordan Henderson stepped up and missed. Uh, but it all turned around, crossbar for Columbia, save for Pickford, and Eric Dyer playing the role of hero today for his country. I tweeted, Shakespeare never wrote anything like England at a major tournament <laughs> after the Yeri Mina goal. And I, I stand by that. Oh, yeah. They are... Even in that little montage there. They are absolutely must-watch TV. But that's the thing. You say Shakespeare never wrote it, but like it feels like everyone has written it. The script is rewritten year after year after year for no. them. And they were following it to a T. Now, this one would have been particularly brutal because they were there. I mean, they were into stoppage time. They knew that it was Sweden that they'd be coming up with next. Uh, they had a hand on the quarterfinals, and then it's Mina again on another corner kick. But put the, pen- put the penalty in the larger pantheon of England disasters. You know, the food poisoning in 1970, the hand of God in 86, the media going after Bobby Robson in 90. You know, all those things. Put right. them all together, and you've got this tale of, of, of tragedy, really. And today, the first major step to suggest that hashtag it's coming home is a real thing was Dyer slotting that penalty in via the flapping hand of Ospina. He got a hand he on it. He did. He got about three fingers to it, but it just wasn't quite enough. This is England's first quarterfinal appearance in the World Cup since 2006, where they went out on penalties to Cristiano Ronaldo in Portugal. Ronaldo hitting the winning penalty for that. Um, a few things jumped to my mind about this game. The first one being, uh, are we still mad at Gareth Southgate? 
I, I feel like I didn't hear much from that chorus earlier today, especially, and we'll talk about Belgium too, but the way Belgium puttered through the first 60 minutes of that one, how did the momentum serve them? It well, took a miracle for them to come back against Japan. Well, I feel in this tournament, ideas of momentum and, and rest and, ooh, this team's got had more days or, ooh, this team's played weak in selection or he shouldn't have done, it doesn't mean anything. Of course not. It means nothing. It's, it's absolute, it's, it's guff. He did the right thing, no, he faced the criticism and they are now reaping the benefits ooh, because like I just said, whoa, whoa, whoa. What? Whoa. They're, All right, so they're playing Sweden instead of Brazil. You're going to sit here and tell me that that's not reaping the benefits? Well, I think... You'd rather, I mean, come on, man. No, I know. But it's worth actually noting at this moment, before we go into a little bit of depth in the game, uh, Henry Winter, the noted journalist, tweeted this out. Gareth Southgate on England injuries, cramp, exhaustion, etc. after that epic. It's like a scene from MASH in there, the England dressing room. So um, they paid for their, their hard-fought going the distance game against Colombia tonight, there's no question. Now, look, England, I thought, were the only team that tried to play in the first and second half. Colombia played for 10 minutes of the regular time, of the regular 90. 10 minutes. The rest was a mixture of disjointed, albeit decent defending with dispiriting tactics and complete, as we say on this show, housery. And then for 10 minutes when they realised they were going out, they somehow... Uh, pulled out this amazing volley from Uribe, which was, I'm not sure if it's going in or not, but Jordan Pickford can't not make that save. And it's an unbelievable save. Yep. For Even if it is drifting wide, how can he possibly know? Um, amazing save. And in the corner, Yerry Mina heads home. And then it changes. The first half of extra time, it's all Colombia. And you feel as if th- they've blown this. England are, are uh, uh, as Rob Stone so eloquently put it, the... Colombians smell blood in the water and that's what it felt like uh, England were better in the second half of extra time and then we went to, to penalties and, and as we know penalties is a lottery or it isn't a lottery depending on, on how you look at it well Jordan Pickford talked about that afterwards and he said that they had been doing research on these players and every player except one it might have been Falcao I think uh, followed the script of which way the England coaching staff told Pickford to dive Yeah, um, he only made one save but the scouting report certainly helped. Right. We had some lemon on Twitter afterwards trying to tell me that the save from Baca with the hand, the flailing hand, was not a good save. Okay. A, because it, A, because it had been done in the in the tournament already. I'm not sure it had. Uh, so they can't both be so good saves? Pick, no. But see, incredible, absolutely incredible stuff. And, and then wanted me to say that Ospina save, which was a great save. Yeah was better. You know, this kind of stuff that goes on. Maybe it was. I don't know. After, bo- they were both excellent. Any, pretty much any save in a penalty shootout is going to be at least a good save. You won't even concede that? Yeah. Come how, on, guy. How, how did you feel about Henderson when he was stepping up to Who, it? Who, me? Yeah. Well, I, I didn't... Well, I hated that he missed because, as I'm sure you'll mention, I couldn't have been more English during this game. Oof. Um, so I didn't want him to miss, but, like, because it's you... I didn't ha- fully hate it because <laughs> of all the ribbing, the Spurs ribbing. That's one, by the way, Tony, someone needs to find Tony Adams for comment. We have, we just have to. We must hear from Spurs Tony Spurs players Adams. went three for three in the shootout, plus Kane's penalty uh, make earlier in the game. So four for four. Kane, his six World Cup goals are already second all time for England behind Gary Lineker's 10. Yeah. Okay. Just in this tournament, well, he's now second all time well, in England World Cup scoring. It's incredible. Not that he should, but he could legitimately go to... Gary Lineker's house and steal his golden boot from the 1986 World Cup because he's already got six. Um, yes, 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 yes. Well, I, I need to collect my thoughts here for one second. Mm-hmm. I had something to say about Henderson. Yeah, back to Henderson. Yeah. <laughs> he's so he's like flicking the ball up, doing little keepy ups, and I thought, ooh, he's confident. He had his head down. You know, he's trying to relax himself. This was some routine he'd worked out. Andrew, when I saw his face, he looked like a ghost. Absolutely daunted. I knew he was going to miss. I absolutely knew he was going to miss. It's so unfair, though, because you're right, he did miss, but does that mean that it was a poorly taken penalty? I mean, look, obviously it, it could have been better. It could have been better, But we yeah. just said it forced an amazing save from David Espina. Uh, so if it's an, it can't be an amazing save and a terrible penalty, right? I mean, Yeah, but so, I, my original point starting out this is it's, a, it's just so fresh in my head, all the things are, are whizzing around. England weren't let play extremely well because... Colombia brought them down to a level that... Here's our Tim Vickery and what he had to say. Colombia got exactly what they deserved and Peckerman should be ashamed of himself. The team was capable of more, even without Hamas. I got to agree with them. They were so negative tonight, Andrew, in everything. 
attach the word negative to soccer, they tick every box. Tonight they did. And and I would echo a lot of Tim Vickery saying that. The, I, I do think he downplays a little bit them not having their best and most creative player Yeah, but does that mean you have to go absolute no, negative? exactly. And that's why ultimately I do agree with them. But it hurts. I mean, look, not having James Rodriguez against a team like England is certainly a factor. But, but you're right. They still have Cuadrado. They still have Falcao. They're still solid in defense with Davinson Sanchez. It's still a very good team. There's no question about that. They uh, couldn't pass the ball for long periods. Then they didn't try. They isolated Falcao. They didn't get Quintero near him, which needed to happen for them to create anything in the final third, I, I I just subscribe to the view that this Columbia team can go home and think, all right, we didn't give that our full shot. We we maybe pulled the oars in a little bit when Hamas was ruled out. Maybe, yeah. And that's the thing. They're going to feel hard done by the 2014 World Cup. Falcao's not there. The 2018 World Cup, Hamas isn't really there. I mean, he played in spurts, but he... Well, he had that great game against Poland. Yes, Um but you know, barely played the first and third games. Didn't play at all against England. You know, it's they've got this great group of players, and for whatever you know, because of injuries, that's kind of sabotaged and, and submarined their chances of being able to do something with it. Now, having said that, who could have ever foreseen Yerry Mina? He, he tonight he became the uh, the fifth defender since 1966 with at least three goals scored in a single World Cup. Three, and he did that just through the first four games. Three monster headers, and this one was almost identical to the one against Senegal, except the difference with the one against Senegal is the guy on the post for England, who was Trippier, tried to head it up over the bar. The guy uh, for Senegal, whose name escapes me, leaned. Almost, yeah, yeah. almost very dro- nonchalant. Nonchalant, yeah. I mean, why are you there, brother, if you're not going to try and flick it up? Trippier almost made the play, too. Mm. But, really but it's the, for- the downward force. Yeah. I'll tell you, Barca fans have got to look at this guy. He had an excellent game tonight. His pass completion which is going to be vital for a team like Barcelona, was was excellent. I'll tell you, if they don't want him, I'll have him at Liverpool. Um, six yellow cards tonight for Colombia in this game. Did they sort of lose their way throughout this? I mean, it, it felt like Mark Geiger th- throughout, especially the first half, was on the verge of losing control. Of this yeah. one. You might even say that he did. I, Geiger negotiated this one, somehow came out the right side of it, I think, but VAR did not help him. VAR let him down massively. Um, on the Barrios headbutt. Andrew, how is that not a red? I thought the same thing. For God's sake, like... And then Jordan Henderson almost had one of his own. Where later. he lets his he head back. He kind of just puts his I, head back. Whatever argu- argument you can make about the Henderson one, that it was the guy was crowding into him a little bit, and it was just him stepping back. You can't make that argument with Barrios, no. who did a double headbutt on Henderson. Now, maybe... Maybe VAR looked at it, and in the same way with the Neymar Lyon incident, they thought that Henderson overhammed it, hammed it up a bit, or was delayed in his falling over, and they decided, you know what, let's not do this. But to me, it was a it was a red card, and they really didn't help Geiger in that situation. I think Geiger's got a problem, though, not so much in the decisions that he makes, but in his ability to be authoritative, and for people seem to. It's open season on him. They crowd round him. They get in his face. They bully him. He turns his back too much as well and walks away, which gives them a chance to chase after him. Well, I was going to say, though, is that him? Is he really behaving that much differently than a referee? Or were Columbia just petulant tonight? They were that. They absolutely were that. But some referees just had... They meet aggression with an authoritative aggression of their own. I'm not I'm not going to bring up Kalina. Oh, there I have. But you were never arguing with him. Or if you did, the argument didn't last very long. He had an ability to just kind of make the decision and swat away the, you know, the, the, the John Terry-esque crowding. Remember Chelsea started that tactic? Oh, yeah. That happened all tonight. And was it petulance from Colombia? 100% it was. England are now 4-0-2 against Colombia uh, all time. Here's Harry Kane. Uh, afterwards on exercising England's penalty demons. We've had some heartache over the years with, with England. Um, I've, been, I've been part of that watching that as a fan, so uh, yeah, to be here and make, make a difference is a, a proud moment for sure. You can hear his voice kind it's, of breaking. It's breaking, yeah. His cousins in Connemara, absolutely delighted. This is a win for Ireland, Andrew. You know, I've been trying to figure out just why I've... like. I, I said before the tournament, if I had, people kept asking me, the U.S. aren't in it, who are you rooting for anybody? And I, my answer was always, nah, not really. If the U.S. aren't in, yeah, I like England. They've got a bunch of Spurs players. Now you've uh, gone. But the game just like, it just took me over today. And I was, when, when Mina scored in the you thir- 93rd, yeah. Yeah, it really was. 
thought that was it. I thought they're following the script. We all know how this is going to end. It's going to penalties. And I just, you know, I, my mind starts going right to the Tottenham players. They're all going to yeah. miss. JJ's going to crush me. My Twitter's going to blow up. Oh, why would I? Cr- I wouldn't crush you necessarily over the Tottenham <laughs> such players. Such a liar. Can I? Can You're I do one a- of the great liars I've ever known? Can I do a quick test? It's called "Are You an Englishman in Disguise?" Sure. Uh, what's your thoughts on James Corden? Uh, I've never seen a show. Okay. Interesting. So we're not. I, I assume that's the wrong answer. That you were hoping for a different answer. Should a cup of tea be served in a mug or in a cup, a china cup? I mean, probably a mug. Do you like the royal... Did you watch the royal wedding? No. Are you a fan of the royals? Yeah, yeah. They're fine. They're fine. Interesting. How am I doing? Um, Benedict Arland, Arnold, good guy or bad guy? <laughs> One of the worst people ever. You sure about that? You hesitated a bit. One of the worst people just, ever? Just Where was of, the hesitation? Just one of them then. Huh. Well, I'm not going to sit here and say, Benedict, there's a lot of bad people. He's not the worst person in history. Just for a guy who was so upset by the burning of our state's capital in 1812, he seemed to have gotten over it pretty quick. Time heals all wounds, JJ. We were teammates in World War II. So at what point do you morph into, from old, big big old Spursy Andy into big old English Andy? English Andy? Um, Well, I mean, the fact that all five Tottenham players played in this game... The fact that all three converted penalties. I think it's also the fact that Kane is captaining the side. Like it's a Tottenham player who's really the face of this team that's playing so well. To watch, you know, Tottenham have kind of gone through this thing over the last few years where uh, they've emerged as one of the giant clubs of England, um, but they don't spend the way that other clubs do. So you would think they'd become kind of the neutrals' favorite, and mm. they have not at mm. all. All I hear, you know, Kane was ripped this year after the Stoke City goal that he said went off his shoulder. Deli Alley is ripped at every turn. Um, so I've never gotten that. In the battle against Leicester City, everyone obviously gravitated towards Leicester. So even when Tottenham has had this rise, uh, the neutral fan has still not gravitated towards them, which is fine. I don't really care. I love them, and that's all that really matters. But it is kind of cool to see the entire country now get behind Kane to watch the whole country celebrate a goal scored by Eric Dyer. Um, you know, the, Danny the Rose, whole, the whole country yeah. of England, oh, not, you, uh, not the U.S. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about England, right? No. Oh no, because English Andy is speaking. It's, it's, it's tough with you sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Danny Rose nearly scores a goal in in extra time to win it. Yeah, put one past the post. Yeah. Um, so it are is, you going to start? kind of cool. Are you going to start calling Var, uh, Jamie Vardy Vards? Yeah, that kind of thing. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. What but about, I have look. I, I don't know. You're going to tell me uh, you're such a phony in your own right because you'll say all these things to me off mic about how much you're enjoying this team, and then the mics go on, and you feel like you need to play this role. You, you're, no, I'm, you're, I've told you I as, as a as an Irish person with huge connections to England, um, I'm I'm hugely conflicted about this. As are many Irish people right now because we we don't dislike the team as no the media are doing their best. They are doing their best to uh, kind of drive that wedge back again, but we definitely don't dislike this team in the way we would have uh, well, disliked You and all sides. your friends are obsessed with this league, the English Premier League. Yeah. You, we you have a long standing... for these players. Yeah. I told you, it's like a big brother effect. It's also a post-colonial hangover when we, we like to see them defeated at times. So it's when Dyer converted the, the fourth penalty, you were I happy, didn't jump sad, up and put, or, or totally you know what whatever. I was? I can't wait for the next chapter in this story. That's how I was. Because you want it to no, because fail I am, spectacularly? Come here. I'll tell you what I am. I am almost an expert at Engli- about England at major tournaments. You know I am. Mm-hmm. I pulled... How quickly had I that email sent to you with... Oh, yeah. I knew every single penalty. I knew I knew the song we needed to play. Because I've grown up with this. The, England and Ireland are, are inextric- inextricably linked through history and culture and, and through my own family. And I'm so fascinated by it. That's it. And you can't accept it. It has to be, oh, you're cheering for them, or oh, you're not. No, because you've said things to contradict. Like, you'll say one thing, oh, you know, how I love this team. They're so likable. And then, you know, you you send me, like, laughing hysterical emojis when Mina scores the equalizer. <laughs> because that is, like, the most England thing to happen in a, in a major tournament game. And by the way, don't don't suck the, the gas out of that one. There's I've, That's in my, re, in my red card. Oh. Even in the moment... Of triumph, there is still reason to go back and admonish certain members who haven't of the English media who haven't learned their lesson from 2016 or 1996 or 1990 or 1986 or 
Go Kane. Oh no, not that. Oh, that it. That for me is that son added again. Yeah, that's not okay. It's not. I agree. I thought, that and was. it's also. I wonder how that works. Harry Kane definitely didn't wouldn't have allowed his image to be used if he knew that those. Um, I mean, maybe there are certain photos that were just made for public use. I'm sure the Sun had their own photo shoot with yeah. England at the time, and they used it. This was pre-tournament, obviously. Yeah. Um, but it's not okay, and it's it's so it it portrays English people in a way that's just not true. You know, it's it's so. N- I don't, I don't know. It's classic them. It's classic them. But it's also, it was very disparaging towards Colombia. Yeah. Extremely. Um, before we move off of this game, I guess the last thing that I would say about it from really the, a more soccer perspective, uh, England, they win. They should feel great about it. I saw the videos of, of uh, the Flatiron Party in London. Um, you know, People should be celebrating this and be loving it because it was a moment that doesn't come around very often, especially for England. But they need to be better. And I know they do have Sweden uh, next, and we're not really going to talk about that because we're going to have another podcast on Thursday previewing the uh, the quarterfinals. But they do need to be better than this. Definitely. Uh, my concerns about Harry Kane dropping off so much to be... Harry Kane played quite a large portion of that game in a number 10 role, which, I mean, is not great for England. They need to figure that out because I don't want him dropping deep. Maybe that's a tactic, especially when Vardy came in. Maybe it's a way to release Vardy and give him more space. I don't like it personally. It takes him out of the area you want him, which is in the box. Eric Dyer and and, and Henderson are... I, they're so poor. They're, they're very, very poor. And it's a worry for me, that midfield. Dyer he, missed a free header. Oh, good Lord. And if he's not end. scoring that, what's he doing in the game? Well, and he referenced that in the sound that we played before. He's saying, I knew I needed to make up for that. They um, don't. They, that midfield does not give you enough. And I'm wondering at what point they get found out. Well, Dyer came on as a sub. I mean, well, he's, right. not, he's not one of... Well, Henderson, Henderson then. Yeah. That's my point. Uh, so that is England. They do advance. They'll face Sweden. In the quarterfinals, uh, we'll zip through some of the other games from the round of 16. We'll start with Brazil 2 and Mexico 0. Mexicans go out once again for the seventh consecutive time. Dos a zero. Unbelievable. Dos a zero in the round of 16. Um, there's been a lot of back and forth over this World Cup for Mexico and whether or not it should be looked upon fondly. Whether or not it was a disaster, there seems to that's, almost that's, be oh. there seems to almost be no one in the middle now. To see some of the things that Mexican fans have been saying, uh, they are irate with the way this played out. And maybe some of that comes from the fact that they didn't love this manager to begin with. So maybe they were looking for reasons to be angry. I think it was always going to fall on him. Yeah, and it seems like they're looking for reasons to want to shuttle him out. Um, I don't know. I guess I would have to say, I know this isn't good for... You know, hot the hot take culture that we're in, but I, I really fall in the middle. Like, there's just I'm sorry, this Mexican team is good. There's no question about that. I under I totally understand why Mexican fans would be disappointed because it's a generation of players that have really been playing together for a while now, have a lot of experience together. So it kind of felt like this was a chance for them to maybe make a little bit more noise than what they've done in the past. Um, but once you line up against Brazil, that's it. That's it. I agree. I broke it down. A little bit differently. I thought for a large part of this tournament, the coach got the tactics right. I thought, how well were they tactically set up against Germany? Yeah, perfect. Now, keep that German game in your mind. Uh They beat South Korea, did the needful, and went into their final game with six points. Now, they collapsed in the second half against Sweden, which was an un, like an unacceptable bottling job by those players honestly for, especially considering that they only needed a point that's all they needed and they couldn't manage that so that was obviously a worry i thought for for periods against brazil they were fantastic and they they the inclusion of marquez i i think people are making too much out of that it was a little bit kooky but i get what osorio was thinking the fact that he could only give them 45 minutes though now you're burning a sub at halftime yeah that that whole part wasn't great but that for me that's not and you say for periods they were fantastic Real, I mean, yes. I thought for maybe the first 15 to 20 minutes they were very good and they had Brazil on their heels a little bit. But they may have emptied but the a, tank. Yeah, after that, it just kind of felt like but even Brazil in, controlled the game. Even in the second half, at, well, I think it was at 1-0 or 0-0, I can't remember. Guardado gets the ball on the right-hand side and switches the play to Lozano with this wonderful ball. Absolutely brilliant ball. And what does he do? He lashes it. 
and it's defended and it brought me back to a major thing and a major criticism. The last third, Andrew, for this Mexican team, for all their great players that they have, they've scored three goals across these four games. That's it. Look at all the chances they had against Germany. Their shot selection. How many times did we see them against Germany? Like 3v2. <laughs> Germany were so open. And in the end, they'd like it would be a misplaced final pass or a shot wide or over the bar or a blocked shot. Mm-hmm. And that's for, that, to me, is what did it for them. You can talk about Vela, Chicharito, Lyon, um, all these players that they have, Guardado in the middle of the field and uh, Lozano, who's really come up in my estimation. But their shot selection and their finishing is what let them down, ultimately. Yeah. That's what I put it down to. Here was uh, Hercules Gomez on ESPN FC on Mexico's World Cup. The Mexican national team had it very clear, very simple. El quinto partido or bust. They didn't get there, so bust. But let's be very clear about this. They defeated the defending World Cup champions in Germany in the first game in very convincing fan fashion. The second game, they dominated South Korea. Six points out of two games and in disaster truck versus Sweden. And then you have to go in playing the fifth, potentially for your fifth game against Brazil. This Brazil, Coutinho, Neymar, William, Paulinho, it was always going to be difficult. There is no shame in losing. There is dignity in losing, especially the way they did. Great effort, but I think it's somewhere in between. If you talk to people back in Mexico, it is a complete and utter failure. I don't see it as that, but I think if the end goal is the fifth and final game, then yes, bust. Yeah, and you said it. Everyone's going to look back on the Sweden game. That was their chance to get into the right side of the bracket, which would have p- yeah. paved an easier path, and that was kind of where this World Cup was lost. And that's one of those times when Osorio needs to be able to shut things down and play a different way, and he wasn't able to. Mexico still created chances against Sweden, but they were giving up tons at the end, and, and Sweden scored them 3-0. I mean, that second half was a, a train wreck. Yeah. They came apart very quickly. And then on the other side of this, of course, is Brazil. It uh, feels like maybe we're starting to see Brazil get rolling a little bit. Yeah, I think so. But would you believe it? There's so much more to come from that attack that I'm I'm going to say yes and no. Um, I, I think they're on the move. They have a couple of questions. I know Gabriel Jesus has a great record in, qual- in, in qualifying and goal scoring but I'm thinking Andrew that maybe they need to switch it up a little bit in the centre now granted on Neymar's goal he could have easily got his toe to that before Neymar did for the opener so what do I know um, but maybe they should introduce Firmino just mix it up because I think Jesus is just a little bit lost as the, as the central as the pivot point at the, the top of the arrow for Brazil defensively how good are they They're, I mean they seem to be getting better yeah. defensively I mean, the one goal that they gave up against Switzerland in the first game has been it so far and it's why they're really the most dangerous team left in this tournament and why it's why they're legitimate favorites to win this tournament because you know, they're so lethal up front like you mentioned with Neymar I mean even Jesus when he's off his game is still a dangerous Coutinho. player Coutinho's been excellent you can bring in Firmino off the bench. And Willian really, has been great. Um, so you obviously know all the names there, but defensively they've just been so sound, so disciplined. I know you suggested maybe they're even better with Marcelo I, not playing. I'm convinced of it. Convinced of it. Well, they're going to be more disciplined in defense when he's Fagner and F- Felipe Luis. I'm I'm happy with that. I'm not. I wonder will Chichi if if Marcelo becomes available, do we see a change there? Yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, Tiago Silva is another guy who we've seen him on good days where he looks like one of the best center halves in the world. And then on other days, he's lost. He was very good. And he was. Um, so if Brazil can sustain that defensively and just continue to be what we know them to be in attack, they're the best team left. And also Neymar continues to get fitter and fitter, which means he's going to grow into the tournament and he should be at peak Neymar in the good way. I loved his first goal. I love the way it was created. Back it was so intelligent because yeah. he he did all the things I want him to do. He sucked in everybody, created the dummy run. William burst. By the way, what a burst of speed to get around the side and then deliver the ball. Mm-hmm. And it, he sucked. All the Mexican defenders were sucked to the ball into William, and he snuck in at the far post. It was a really well crafted goal by Brazil. And if there's more of that to come, they they really do look like. Red hot favorites. I'll have a little bit more on Neymar later in this podcast, but before that, uh, we do have to mention what happened with him and Miguel Leon. Uh, to me, I don't know where you stand. Well, yes, I do. I've known you for years now, and I know that you despise everything about Neymar. Yeah. Um, for me, this was two men acting like absolute fools. 
Now, first off, you're right. Whatever you're about to say about Neymar and the way he behaved after that happened, you're a thousand percent right. He looked like a complete clown. He's better. You're better than that. You don't need to be resorting to those kind of tactics. You're the maybe the best player left in this tournament with Messi and Ronaldo out. Um, you know, you, Brazil are the the clear favorite left in this tournament. You just don't need to be resorting to that level of play against a team that you should be beating. It just makes you look so small and so childish. Uh, so yes, whatever people want to say negatively about him for carrying on the way that he did and how ridiculous he looked, I agree with all of it. Um, however, is Miguel Leun out of his mind? What is he thinking? If you're Mexico, you need everything possible to go right for you to have a chance to beat Brazil in a World Cup game. Uh, so he comes in off the bench, and he's going to do something as stupid as that in a VAR world that we're living in now? I mean, come on, man. I know it was just kind of, as far as stomping on someone goes, I don't. I almost don't want to use that term because this was not a stomp no, in the traditional sense. No, it was sense. just a, a little sneaky one that could have gone badly wrong. But he knew exactly what he was doing. There was no accident about it. He put his foot on Neymar's ankle. Yeah, but it didn't hurt Neymar that no, much. No, it didn't. And that's why I said everything about Neymar because right. he looked terrible. But... You're Mexico. You can't have a guy sent off. If that's it, it's game over. Now, sure enough, it wound up being game over anyway, but you didn't know that in the moment. What was the score when that happened? Was It, it was still 1-0. I think so. Yeah, well, even the second if, goal didn't occur to stoppage time. It was so dumb and so careless from a guy who I thought was having a pretty good tournament and who I think of fairly highly as a good player. Um, and I don't know what he was thinking because he could have really cost his team dearly. Like I said, they lost anyway, but man, was that an incredibly dumb move by him to even tempt the referees to pull out the red. I don't think there's much more to say on that. I, to- I totally agree with you. I-, I also think that Neymar does get kicked around. Of course he does because he is that player. But, you know, you have to get on with it. It happened to all the best players in the world. Maradona, Zidane, they all get that kind of attention and you have to be... Um, you can't be like him. Uh, also, if and you know me, I adore to read. Um, it's important to read Tim Vickery's piece on InvestoBet. It's on his um, on his Twitter timeline about the monster of of Neymar that's been created when he was a a young player in senior football in Brazil in 2010, when people were still talking about bringing him to the 2010 World Cup as an 18 year old, and he lost it, absolutely lost it when he wasn't allowed to take a penalty. This is a long time. Um, how would I say, uh, cultivation of this monster of Neymar that we see on the field now, where he believes that he can dictate what is a foul. When he goes over, I believe now, when Neymar throws himself over and dives for the slightest contact and completely embellishes a tackle, I believe he now thinks that is a foul anyway because it's on him. He has built up this complex around him and Tim Vickery's piece is unbelievable. Yeah, and I read that actually and he... um Tim Vickery said something that was really interesting to me that I've never really thought about, but he said Neymar is polarizing in that he is a sensational talent. There's, yeah. there's just simply no denying that. Mm. Um, but he does carry himself in a way that is childish. And Tim mentions the fact that, look, look at his jersey. He still has Neymar Jr. on the back of his jersey, which almost serves as this constant reminder that he is a boy in the way that he can, conducts himself on the field at times. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, brilliant talent, uh, but... Look, if you're expecting uh, Chi-Chi or anybody on his team to bring him into line before the next game, that's not happening. So expect more of this from Neymar. Oh, yeah. This is who he is. No, no. He, I don't think he'll ever change. He'll yeah. be in his mid-30s playing and he'll be resorted. This is just the, this is what you get with Neymar. Love him, hate him, but this is totally who he is. Ken Early in the Irish Times said that in, on planet Neymar, nobody is telling Neymar that Neymar is wrong. <laughs> we move on from Brazil and Mexico to what is probably the game of the tournament so far. Mm-hmm. Here it is on Fox Sports. On up. To the middle, Courtois grabs it in traffic. Looks up, rolls it ahead. De Bruyne's on the move. Good numbers here. De Bruyne leads it on the right side. Lukaku makes the run. Lukaku lets it go. Chanley, go. Belgium leads. Chanley. Unbelievable to watch it play out the way that it did. And the funny thing was, it was 2 0. It then became obviously 2-2 in the blink of an eye. Yeah. The fact that it only ended 3-2, in watching the last, what would you say, 10 to 15 minutes of that game, it could have been 6-2. I mean, oh, it every bit like of it. It was just so relentless from Belgium, and Japan were just looking at that clock thinking, let's just get to extra time, please, extra time. Let's get to penalties as quickly as possible. But Japan kept playing themselves, and that's ultimately what cost them. That's Sending amazing. Sending all men forward on a corner. Everybody. But it was like crazy stuff from Japan, but... Do you know what? I loved it. I absolutely loved it. They are a team who do not know how to play any any other way. 
Japan? Yeah. It's all go. It's it's. We what are you a- talking about? Akira Nishino was furious with himself because of what he resorted to in the prior match, in their last group stage game. Remember, he said that they re- they decided to resort to just let's just stop playing altogether. Right, because- that's the point. That was a complete aberration of how they want to play. And w- the one time they needed to shut things down, that corner should have been taken short, and the clock should have been played out. That's what they should have do, and they didn't do it. They lofted a ball in that was easily caught by Courtois, and they have men and numbers that can't get back. They had, they absolutely emptied the tank by playing this. By the way, can I say breathtaking football? It was absolutely beautiful to watch. They had this system whereby anybody in possession of the ball, there was a run being made, diagonal, people in in space. It was incredible. There was a moment where Honda came into the game and Kagawa, who who looked like Maradona, he was just that good. He picks out a pass for Honda, this slide rule pass between two Belgian defenders. And I think it was Courtois uh, made a brilliant save to deny him. Japan play have played the best football for me in that one game. I nobody else. Wow! Played. Oh, it was so enjoyable. What a statement! Wait. By the way, you just made one of the all-time Monday morning quarterback comments that I think I've ever. What heard. do you mean? And I'm so annoyed that you just said what you said. Go on, say it. You believe that? Obviously, things played out a certain way. So I'm going to look bad saying this, but you know what? I don't even care. Go ahead. You believe that Japan should have taken a short corner there. In their mind, this is almost this is essentially the last kick of the ball. I mean, the the number of things that had to go wrong for them to lead to what wound up happening no. is is not what, easy to what foresee. What are you talking so, about? That is total so you think nonsense. Japan in a tie game that's about to head to extra time where they are clearly gassed, and if it gets to extra time, maybe they can get to penalties. But thirty minutes more of Belgium pouring that on, Belgium are going to win that game. They I, just are. You're insane. So, so for you Japan take- to think on the last kick of the ball, they shouldn't try to score. They I have to try to score. You're, you're in, how many goals have they scored from corner kicks? So take it short and let's just end this. No, you you have to. That well, is a, do a short corner. Do something else. Don't loft it into a goal kick. No, you're right. It was the, it was the, mental. The kick was terrible and Courtois played it beautifully. But to, it was total but to say naivety. That they shouldn't have even tried is wrong. They had to try to score. That is they, that, that may have been their last chance to score. Andrew, for how all we can, know, how can you show the kind of um, what would we say? cynicism that they needed in the in their qualifying game to get through and not do it in that game take them to extra time there was i know they were they were then they were going to get they slaughtered. were still creating chances i don't i don't know if that's the case you don't know that either you just agreed with me when i said that game was on a pace to end 7-2 i don't i don't agree with that because i i actually japan were still creating chances after the two after it Belgium leveled. They were. It was one opportunity after another, after another, after another for Belgium. Maybe I've watched it so much football that I'm that I'm losing my mind. But Japan still created chances well, after after the uh, equalizer from uh, Fellaini. I don't know. I I just think to say that they shouldn't have tried when it was. I mean, it felt like it was going to be the last kick of the ball. But everything just happened so quickly. <laughs> the idea that you think they did the right thing is just incredible to me. Absolutely incredible. I can't even imagine how much Nishino would be getting killed by the the Japanese media if, in if, if they if they do like that. that if they just if they play it short and they just keep it in the corner and they let the whistle blow and, and then they go on to extra time and get slaughtered. People aren't going to look throw back. everyone people into the box. Gonna, people there was, won't look back. They're right. No, maybe throwing everyone in the box was wrong, but to say that they shouldn't have even taken the corner from the you had to from, you had to try from the minute that uh, Courtois gets the ball, Andrew. And he rolls it out like you're De, right. De Bruyne sees vast oceans of space in front of him. Not saying I agree with the fact it. that they it was, put everyone forward. Was, Obviously, that no, was wrong. No, Lukaku's run to to create that goal was excellent. To pull defenders in and pull them out twice, fantastic. And Chadley to go like uh, Ben Johnson sprinting towards the box was amazing too. Absolutely fantastic. I get that. And the, st- the step over by Lukaku, great. Everything about it was but beautiful. It was just opened up by uh, by naivety from Jap- Japan, and I hate saying that because I I I thoroughly enjoyed the way they played their football in that game. I don't think I've enjoyed a, per- a single performance by a team as much as that in the tournament. Here's how it sounded on Belgian television. Spurs 
Spursy Andy was quietly pumping his fist during this one too. Yeah, the French contingent there for um, for Belgium TV and uh, Philippe Albert, I believe, was on co-commentary for that former Newcastle player. Hmm. So, what do you agree? Is that your game of the tournament so far? I loved it. Everything about that. Um, I will say this just quickly: a quick tactical point. Carrasco and Vertonghen on the same side with the Belgium operating a back three. Good Lord in heaven. Have you seen the scene in Terminator 2? Never seen it. You've never seen it. Well, people will know. There's a scene where she's having a dream, that one of the main characters, and she's holding onto a fence, and there's a nuclear blast, and she's just, her skin and everything is just torched, and all that's left is a skeleton holding onto the fence. Oh. That was Vertonghen. <laughs> Well, Prior to Carrasco being taken off, he was totally exposed. The first goal. I don't know what he's doing. On the the, the oh, first goal man. is actually a mistake. He's too casual. He thinks he's going to stop that ball with his foot and it gets right underneath him. But every other time Japan went down that right-hand side, Vertonghen was scorched. And yet the game will probably be remembered in addition to Chadley's goal as Jan Vertonghen converting on one of the most ridiculous headers I think I've Looping ever seen. Looping header. By the way, I, I've looked at it and I've looked at it. Yeah, the keeper's not in a great spot. He's come over way too far. But Vertonghen's put it in the one spot... It's, it makes it impossible from the keeper at that angle to get back if and get it. If you ask for Tongan to do that, no, he couldn't. He will never do it again. No, he won't. Total, and, total and from, fluke. And from like, I mean, it all started on a terrible clearance attempt by Japan, where it was air mailed back into the box, right to where Vertonghen happened to be. Yeah. But that ball came down. From, I mean, that was kicked what like fifteen <laughs> yards up into the sky. Looping came, header came right down on Vertonghen. Said he said afterwards he did not mean to do it. He was honest. Um, that was incredible, that goal. And, and I just, God, I felt so bad for Japan afterwards. I mean, what a way to lose. Bobby Martinez, his hide has been saved by a Jan Vertonghen looping header mm-hmm. from outside the box on the left-hand side, Marilyn Fellaini and Nasser Chadley. But give, People need to remember that. Yes, but Martinez, it's not just luck. Now, the Vertonghen header is luck, but he did make the decision to sub on Chadley and Fellaini. I mean, his two subs scored two of the biggest goals in Belgium's history. Yeah, so he I does know. need to get some credit for that. I, 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 but I do wonder if he's going to have to change this back three. Oh, idea. God. Our, I'll tell you, I don't think they can win Axel Witzel as well. Oh, so the amount of space that he gave. Inu, um, Inui to, to, to hit what was a brilliant shot. but Modric-esque. He, yeah, and he, but he had time to tee it up and yeah. everything. What a game. Oh my God, JJ. I can't even believe it. I can't believe that's the game we came to shouts over. Isn't it? Belgium and Japan was the game where I screamed at you. Yeah, because you don't respect me. No one does. I I understand. I do respect you. (laughs) Um, To think that... I mean, I said it was going to be tough keeping this under an hour. Forget about it. (laughs) Just forget about it. People are going to listen anyway. By the way, you... Well, they've all checked out At this point, you must listen to the end. Uh, Because we're going to do your iTunes uh, reviews, some of them that we've selected, and uh, we want you to hear our Red Cards and Men men of the Match. We've gotten through some of the games that I was most... I mean, some of these now were... like uh, I've got here Spain-Russia next. JJ, that feels like it was two weeks ago. I know. So many things have happened since. We'll go through it quickly. Russia advancing over Spain, 4-3 on penalties. This was really the game that felt like it it opened up the tournament. Um, Especially for now, England. And the tear ducts of Sergio Ramos, which I'm delighted about. <laughs> yeah, there weren't too many people who were sad to see that. Not that I dislike Spain, but he is that guy. Uh, I don't know. It was... It was terrible. It was so... It was just so frustrating to watch. And mm. I referenced this a little bit earlier in the way Sweden scored their goal. I mean, yes... There were moments where Spain did try. I don't mean to say that they never tried to make an attempt to score. Um, They did score in this game. Um, But, my God, if you're going to control, what was it, like 80% of the possession? 1,200 passes. Yeah, there just simply has to be, even by luck, by falling ass backwards into it, there just has to have been more of an opportunity to put goals in the net than this. Yeah. But look at oh, Costa. Look, look, at, look at how they underused Costa. Like, we saw Costa beast Pepe for, on a long ball, turn and score against uh, Portugal. Now, Russia really didn't. Russia defended with two banks of four. I mean, it was, it was let's be honest, 11 men behind the ball. But to not once in that game ping a ball in high into Costa's chest and get players playing off him. And when you finally do get a cross into the box, a great cross, who's on the end of it? Or 
wasn't on the end of it, but who's playing centre forward or in, in, who's come on for Costa? Iago Aspas. There was one cross comes in almost immediately after Costa has left the field. A ball he could attack. Rodrigo came in, I thought he was good. Almost scored. Yeah. But look, look, like, how does it take you that long to do it? Ping a ball into him and get players playing off him. It can't hurt. Do it once. They never did it once. It just feels like with Spain that I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's time to abandon the style. It's so in, you got to mix it it's up. It's so inborn in who they are that I don't even. I don't. If Look, you're going to do that, it has to be a gradual thing. But it just feels like the Spain of 08, 10, 12. They had players who were masters of the style, but were also capable of recognizing a moment. You know, Zabi Alonso could play in a long ball when he saw David Villa breaking to net. Mm. Um, it just feels like you know, Diego Costa, is he's good. He had a decent tournament. Look, his goal against Iran was one of the luckiest goals of the tournament. He's good, though. Um, they didn't get him but, the ball. No, no, they really didn't. And I don't, I don't want to downplay what Russia did. Defensively, they were incredible. Um, but it just felt like you can Spain, was, you can Spain was never willing to try anything different. Here's, find a different way to break through. Fire a few shots from 24, 25 yards out. You have players of that caliber who can maybe score on those, and they just didn't try. Can I, can I just make a quick comparison? And they're not the same kind of game because obviously Belgium came out and played. But what you have is in Japan, not enough fear of the counterattack. And in Spain v. Russia, too much fear of the counter. When Russia did counter and win the ball back, they were falling over each other. They couldn't get a shot on goal. Spain showed them far too much respect. The reason they never passed to Diego Costa was because they were afraid the ball had come out. Because you know, you know what happens when you hit a long ball. It's often 50-50. So they were afraid that the, the Russian centre halves would head the ball away and suddenly they'd be on a break. Russia ain't that good. Spain paid them way too much respect. Yeah, here's Steve McManaman on ESPN FC talking about Spain. They were really disappointing, weren't they? I, um, they were caught between two styles, whether to want, want to pass the ball around nicely or, you know, play to Diego Costa up front. For the, for the love of, of, I mean, I love Fernando Hierro, but why he chose five midfielders and had Koke further back mm-hmm. in defensive areas than Busquets and then three of the same players in front... Um, when they knew they were going to control the game and have more possession. And um, they couldn't change it. They haven't got the personnel up front, unfortunately. They had in the past. They haven't now. Aspas, Rodrigo, Diego Costa. The way they play is, is not the style for them. It's fair. Yep. I think um, it's distillation of what we just said. I don't know just how much I'm going to blame the whole managerial disaster that this was for Spain. Do you honestly the think tournament. they play anything, anything different? Not really. No, I really don't. And I mean, maybe you, a couple decisions here or there. But ultimately... You should beat Russia. They needed it. They needed. Remember the six goals they got against Argentina. They needed a team that was that feckless in defending, and and, uh, and <laughs> that's what they needed. And open, and they were never going to get that against Russia. Uh, Croatia and Denmark. Croatia go through three two on penalties. Um, this was really of all the games in this tournament. I found myself feeling really bad for Denmark in the way that this played out. It felt like such a roller coaster for them in that they score in the first minute and had to be thinking, oh my God, look at us right now. And then they give up one in the fourth minute. Um, the penalty decision in stoppage time or in extra time that Casper Michael then saves. It just felt like there had to be all these moments throughout the course of that game where Danish fans were thinking, oh my God, we're going to go on and do this only to in the end have it come crashing down on them and Croatia do in fact go through. Um, I don't know what really to, it yeah. was a it, it was a deflating game really on a day of not great games. Yeah, a lot being made after this about um, the way referees need to manage goalkeeping on penalties. What do you think? We talked about this after what happened with the Ireland under 17s. Yeah, so they enforce it there, but they make no effort when they have video review technology to, to even try and enforce it in in the men's world cup. Boy, it's such a tough one. I mean, if, if you look at Pickford tonight... If you enforce tonight, it once, you better enforce it every single time. And if you do that, penalties are going to just become... You know, it's going to become a sham. What Pe- what Pickford did tonight on the in the back of save, I believe like he, he jumped forward to the side, but his trailing foot was on the line. Um, I think there should be a little bit of leeway, but how much leeway do you give? I don't know. I think I, it's another one that is really a grey area. I mean, you've, you kind of... Imagine if VAR went back on all those penalties in this game, in the Croatia-Denmark game. The game, it'd still be going now. It'd be so many delays. I know. And maybe that's what they don't want. 
Maybe they're just saying, hey, the attacker's 12 yards out. He's got the major advantage. If, if the goalkeeper sneaks a yard or two. There was one clip that I saw, um, because forward momentum is what these goalkeepers are trying to create themselves moving forward to try to cut down on angles. Um, it might have been Rui Patricio, some keeper in this tournament that was facing a penalty at some point, starts about a yard, half a yard back behind, the behind his goal line. Mm. So he can start moving forward and propel himself forward with forward momentum while not leaving his goal line. Right. Which seems like an interesting, a, a, a smart strategy and a rule abiding one, whereas other keepers are getting, are just getting away with doing this. Um, I don't know how you litigate this sort of thing because they they just all do it. I can't tell you how many penalties I've seen in my life where I'm like, well, he was off. he was yeah, well off. Absolutely. Um, let's see. But speaking of that kind of thing, uh, I'd have to look at it one more time. But there was an angle of the to go back to Belgium Japan for a sec when Courtois grabs the corner and rolls it out. Didn't like it was almost he almost guzanned it, the guzan Jamaica. But didn't you think oh, that it was, was almost outside? I thought it was really close. I, I have to go back again, again. How many games in the Premier League for they all years? Do it. That's why that game. That's why Jurgen Klinsmann was right oh. when he said that game was fixed. You got to hit the Andrew brings us down button for this. <laughs> Let's see, uh, France Argentina. This was if um, if Belgium Japan is the game of the tournament. This one's not far behind. This was really really fun. Uh, it was so long ago now. I don't even know how much there is for you and I to to say about it, other than. Uh, I saw Arsene Wenger talking about Kylian Mbappe, saying that he is not far off from dominating the sport, and I think I agree. I, I really do. I think he's 19 years of age, and it's amazing the season he had at Monaco, injury interrupted at PSG. There's no doubt his quickness of thought for his first goal is what really struck me. That was a mad scramble. He gets it out of his feet, drills it. Should Armani have done better? Definitely. But... Uh, Unbelievable to do that. Um, for the penalty in particular, the burst of speed to take it past um, those Argentinian defenders. And then obviously Rojo makes it easy for him by just tumbling into him, even though he's kind of moving away the from The speed, him. though. I would like to see, when the tournament's over, I'd like to get Mbappe together next to Juan Cuadrado, and I would like to see them race. Because I think they're the two fastest guys in this tournament. Okay. Can we make that happen? Oh, I'm sure it'll be easy to do. Can I just say... Um, that was a game that suited Mbappe, right? Absolutely. The challenge of Uruguay, there will be no space in behind. France will have to do things differently. But he's a wonderfully talented player. He's got a, more than a bag full of tricks. He's got all the skills in the world. But, you know, I don't want to see... This is not a coming out party. for, for Oh, those, no. For those of us who watch the game close, well, there's a lot of talk, Andrew, well, about... Monaco, a year and a half ago, yeah, was g- the coming out party. Torching Man City. is <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, but there was... I mean, there's a lot of casual watchers, and for the first time... It's probably the first time really. Well, he's gone. He's gone mainstream. He's gone global. You know, now. That's rid- he was already mainstream. It's a ridiculous. But can, we, can we talk about France in particular? Of course. I don't. You asked the question: Was this the performance we needed to see from France? No, it wasn't. Okay. It was Argentina at their just their terrible, terrible um, moment. In they allowed the kind of things that Fra- like France could play that way. It was individuals breaking out of their. Like, look at all the goals. Like, Pavard's goal. There was no great, like... That's my new goal of the tournament, yeah. by the way. I know you said you're not ready to anoint it that, but I, loved I think it. I liked it oh, more I than, loved than it. nachos. Well, because it's just the slow-mo angle yeah. was just amazing. But that was a, a moment of individual brilliance, unexpected, from a guy with nine caps from Stuttgart <laughs> playing. You know, um, Mbappe, again, was his own ability. And the, the goal, which was the breakaway goal, which I believe was the fourth goal, I mean... Where, what, we were on about Japan naive defending. What what's going on there? That's just shocking from from Argentina. I know. So France, look, France are France. It's it's not the flair we want. It's not the collective we want. But the individuals bursting out of those shackles is is what's going to propel them forward. Yeah, I did want to say one thing about Messi. Um, if this was his final performance wearing the Argentinian stripes. Uh, a little bit sad that the lasting memory will probably be him in what was it the 85th minute when they desperately need a goal to maybe give themselves some hope. Sure enough, Aguero did score in stoppage time. Who knows how it would have gone? But him kind of getting himself into position. You've seen Messi score in situations like that before, and it was just kind of a feeble mm. dribbler on net. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously he's done so much for Argentina. They're not in this tournament. We don't have to go back and say all that, but. Yeah, this was this was disappointing for him. There's no, there's just no way around that. Yep, it was, and um, 
again, we can. We, I think we've gone over this enough with Argentina yeah. on this podcast. I'm I'm not sure how to set this team up with what to to make the best for him, and it'll be interesting to see if he if he wants to go again for Copa America. Yeah. Uh, last but not least, Uruguay and Portugal. The only thing I have to really say about this one is that. Um, I think I would say that Uruguay is the most underrated team in the tournament. Certainly the most underrated team left. Because I feel like they're kind of treated as though they're a smaller nation, but they're not. Now, look, I don't know. It's still unknown what Edison Cavani's status is going to be. That for me is huge. And it's huge. It's absolutely huge. But um, you know, they're so good defensively, and they may have the best attacking duo left in this tournament if Cavani's healthy alongside Luis Suarez. And we haven't even really seen the best of Suarez just yet. And also, Arsenal fans who, who definitely think he's signing for them. How good has Torreira been in the midfield for them too? Um, they, Dermot Corrigan tweeted this out and it, it's so true. They are the international version of Atletico Madrid. They, well, I mean, look at their personnel right, too. Him and Ed and, and, and Godin. But they're, yeah. they're set up to be a tournament team Andrew they can hurt you and then you have to find a way to penetrate them and it's so difficult and I really I enjoyed look at the first goal as well the, the long range 1-2 um, for when uh, Cavani picks out Suarez and then continues his run to the back post it, it diminishes the goal slightly that it came off like his face yeah. or his chest but even still what a move and then Cavani second where he opens his body up and just curls it to the far post. It was just graceful and beautiful. And they are, there's something beautiful about watching them. I love that that hard nose defending. Yeah. I and really look, do. It starts with their manager, who was a defender himself, Oscar Tabarez. And, and I think the way that they play, we talk about Spain being beholden to a style. Uruguay are to a certain extent as well. But look, it does help when this man, this is now their fourth World Cup. Under this manager, I mean, he was with them. Oh six, I think, was his first in Germany. Um, Continuity of style, stability. We yeah. always talk about the importance of stability, and Uruguay have that, and they play a certain way, and it certainly works for them. Do you think they've expanded from the aforementioned Tim Vickery's view of football in a bunker? <laughs> well, yes, a they little, did, yeah. a little bit. Yeah, um, both the goals I thought. I loved Cavani's second. The way he squares it up, curls it around the keeper. That's a goal that's made for slow motion. Oh yeah, everything about it. I'm, I'm. I was when I saw him pull up with the, I think it's a calf. Again, the calf strain. Well, they said there's no ligament damage, but the, I mean, it's not good. It's obviously not good. Uh, that's our look at the round of sixteen. But I mean, before we can fully move on, <laughs> round of sixteen trivia. You ready? Oh, Here we go. Don't God. act like you don't like it. You love it. You're just putting on airs. You're such a phony. Uh, ready? I, I should punch you in the mouth. For then do it three you times. You want to do all, all show. You've acted in phony ways. You love England, but then on the podcast you hate England. You act like you hate the trivia, but you high-five me as soon as it's over. Ready? Yeah. Matthias Jorgensen scored 50 sec- 57 seconds into Denmark's match against Croatia. That was the fastest goal at a World Cup since this player. The fastest goal at a World Cup since... Ooh. Doesn't Brian Robson have the record in 82 in Spain? Um, I hate you in this moment. Clint Dempsey, 29 seconds in against Ghana four years ago. Oh, he beat the record. Didn't re- forgot about that. With their next game, Sweden will have played 51 games at the World Cup all time. That's the second most World Cup games played without having won the competition. Which nation has played more than Sweden without having won a World Cup? Mexico. Correct. 57 games. I thought you were going to say the Netherlands. They mm. have 50. But you didn't. You said yep. the right answer. But don't forget <laughs> Netherlands non-qualification. For a, like a generation. Yep. Uh, and last but not least, right now at this World Cup, the same guy leads all players in shots, shots on target, goal-scoring chances created for teammates, and number of times fouled. Who is that guy? Neymar. He is the answer. He leads all of those categories right now at this World Cup. And yet, and yet all people want to do is focus on his antics. It clouds the fact that he is also awesome. Can you be less? um, He's great. And people just don't want him to be. And I understand it. Uh, He looks like a complete fool when he's rolling on the ground. By the way, some of the uh, GIFs that have been, is it GIFs or GIFs? I don't know what you say. GIF. Yeah. 
that have been created out of things that Neymar has done in reacting to fouls are just the best. Twitter, which I largely don't like, has been really on its game during this World Cup. Have you seen the one where they've put like um, a, a child's uh, stabilizer around him? You know, one of those things where a little walker, Charles Walker, it's got all these little play things. <laughs> I have they've not. put it around him. My favorite is the one where he's rolling, like yeah. rolling through different scenes in history and like knocking people over. <laughs> but But again, like... It's sad that the conversation always veers into that direction, and it's by his own doing, so I don't have a ton of sympathy for him, but don't let it cloud your judgment in judging just how great of a player he is. Let's see, in lieu of a mailbag, we'll do our actual mailbag on Thursday's podcast, but we had asked you um, to give us some iTunes reviews, and in your review, give us your favorite round of 16 moments, and as you guys always do, you came up huge, gave us some great ones, Um JJ, what do you have? Right. Uh, the mailbag will return on Thursday. Right. So those of you who have mailed us, we will get to that. Uh, uh, Pedos started us off with, uh, as a fan of Brazil, I don't have any round of 16 moments. Winning it is an obligation. I do, however, have a worst round of 16 memory. Losing to Argentina in 1990, despite outplaying them for most of the match. This is Maradona. And he gets the ball through. Can he just scores? Yeah, it's against Maradona, pal, you know. But Brazil, Argentina. That was a good Brazilian team. They had a player called Correca on it, who was excellent. 1990, yeah. Yeah, Zed Hamilton. As a newer fan since 2014, I would have to say my favorite moment was the Chris Wondolowski misc versus Belgium. What? Ugh. So he's clearly not American. No, no, no. He he went uh afterwards. He was oh, so he's being sarcastic. Yes, but he didn't give me anything else. So we're going with that. Oh, so we have to play it. Well, here it is. Flick to Those up anyway wouldn't have counted. The United States pushing numbers forward extremely dangerous. Oh no, he's on, isn't he? He's on side. Yeah, he's, he's on. on by a mile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's on. That is a massive chance. He fell to exactly the right guy, too. Oh. So the whole debate, because I listened to that call where Ian Dark says he's offside. Then I listened to the BBC call where they also, same thing, flags up, wouldn't have counted. And this, it's almost like they're following the same script. Then they look at the replay and say, no, 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 he's on. Uh, there is some debate as to whether or not that goal would have counted. I don't think it, it would in. have counted. It, what I read is that it would have. Oh. The referee um, has the chance to overrule the linesman if he thinks... The, the he ruling. was seven miles right. on site. So, and in the post match report, the U.S. were not listed as having had any offsides in the match. Oh. So the referee apparently did overrule the linesman in that moment. So, so I do. It's still not a hundred percent clear, um, but I do believe the goal would have wound up counting. Now, in going back and rewatching it again, we're so hard on him. On this show, like the Wando miss has just kind of been like a reflex yeah, but when we see a bad uh, miss. It's not. It looks bad because it's him and the keeper and a and a gaping net. But I do think that we're a little hard on him. That it was a little bit more difficult of a finish than we give it credit for. Courtois is racing after him, uh, coming at him. He takes it on a bit of a half volley. It's not an. It's not as easy of a finish as I think it, it appears. To I be. think the worst thing about it is is that everyone in MLS was pointing to his great goal scoring record. At the time, and we're saying he should be starting. It's why he was included on the team was to finish chances like that. And he did not finish. He hit that like a centre back. <sighs> Kay Reinhardt, I fell in love with soccer during the 2010 World Cup, and as much as I love Donovan in that World Cup, it is the Dutch breaking Mexican hearts in 2014 that is my favourite. And may I say, this is me now. What a wonderfully petty way to do it. <laughs> this is Klaus Jan Huntelaar. His winner with award-winning commentary, actually, by Jack Van Gelder of Dutch TV. Toch zijn moment in dit toernooi wordt het een kiefje. Zo te noemen vanaf 88. Erin komen hij scoren. Hij scoort! Hij scoort! Hij scoort! Hij scoort! Nederland met twee voor. Mag ik je zoenen? Mag ik je zoenen? Nee, nee, er zijn grenzen dan ook. Wow! Wow! They're laughing because Huntelaar, after he scores, like runs over to the corner flag and takes this leaping judo kick at it. It was it was pretty cool. Do you, did you think of our one of our most famous Dutch drops when you heard that? Oh, your guy? No, the two Dutch, Dutch our Dutch uh, friends. Yeah, I, I did think of it. Van der Graafschap <laughs> of the Amsterdam Police. <laughs> um, 
boy, that was a brutal one for Mexico. Leading 1-0, Snyder scores in the 88th, and then Mar- this Marquez, happens. Marquez did make contact with, with Robin, though. So uh, that one is so interesting, too, and I went back. This is FIFA TV. Aryan Robin was interviewed, and he was asked, he was asked, was it a penalty? Was it a penalty? Yeah. And do you follow the controversy afterwards? Because a lot of people were talking about it and making sure. Yeah, of course, but it's, I think it's, it's part, of the, part of the game. You know, uh, it's, it's such a big stage. I mean, you were talking about the World Cup, and uh, so everybody's talking, talking about it. So that's, that's I think, um, also the nice thing about football, you know. Is it? One of the nice things about football. He also went diving. on in another interview said, oh, I dived in that game. It just wasn't that one. I watched that replay several times, and I think I'm ready to just settle on, if you're a Mexican fan, it will always be a dive. If you're a Dutch fan, it will always be a penalty. And everyone else is just kind of, it's a free-for-all as to what you think. It's really, really close. Um, U.S. Yeah. Arsenal piles on every single time Mexico next gets knocked out but especially 2002 hashtag Dos Acero forever it's a terrific ball to pick out Eddie Lewis and Donovan's arriving here it's 2-0 and the USA can dream of reaching the quarterfinals the country officially placed last at France 98 are going into the last eight God, that goal is just awesome. That probably would have been the one that I uh, that I submitted to. CD Castano, Colombia versus Uruguay, and the James Rodriguez goal. And James Rodriguez! He's a star, all right! A shining, glittering star! Two weeks ago, just a precocious talent. Now, a global hit! Oh, that is fun going back and listening to uh, some of these memories from the round of 16. And so we will enlist you guys to do this once again. iTunes reviews. Give us, now that we're into the quarterfinals, your favorite memories from the quarterfinals. And we will get to them uh, not on Thursday's podcast, but when the quarterfinals end. Uh, our next podcast after that, which will probably be the following Tuesday after the semifinal. I would, semi. I would think so. Uh, so there you go. Let's see. We're not going to really do a what to watch for because that's what Thursday's podcast is devoted to. So we move directly to red, red card. card. Let's see. I'm going to go first here, JJ. I give my red card to a small group of South Korean fans. I say a small group because I truly believe that these people do not represent the majority, but I make them my red card nevertheless. Upon returning home after being eliminated from the World Cup, the Korean team was lining up for a photo at Incheon Airport when they were pelted with eggs. You may remember a similar incident occurring four years ago when the Korean team had toffees thrown at them, which is considered to be a major insult in South Korea. Uh, The Korean FA said it will not press charges against the offending parties. This was from an airport police official. He said, quote, throwing eggs is considered an assault, but it's also an offense which can't be prosecuted without the victim's objection. JJ, I need your help here. They were never supposed to advance out of this group. They beat Germany in one of the most dramatic games of the tournament and actually finished ahead of Germany in the group. They narrowly lost to Mexico by a goal after really fighting till the end, scoring yeah. in stoppage time. It was a pretty valiant effort. And they only lost they, one they they lost to Sweden. Sweden uh, yeah, on just a second half penalty. No one blew them out. They didn't do anything to embarrass themselves. Quite the opposite. I thought it was a pretty valiant effort from a team that was really undermatched at this tournament. Uh, this is one for these South Korean fans who decided to buy eggs, bring them to the airport, and throw them at this team. JJ, this is one that I simply cannot understand. I don't know if you can help me on this, but I don't get it. I don't get it either. I, th- I thought, actually, in considering the lack of expectations and the way... By the way, all the memories they got from that final game, that was, that was they, epic. They sh- that's why I said a small group of Korean fans, because when they showed the scenes in the crowd, Korea, they, South Korea were out, but in beating Germany, the way they scored that second goal to clinch it, they showed South Korean fans crying. In the stands, I'm gonna players to... so- on the field sobbing. So I don't understand why these fans would go to this lengths to embarrass their team like that. By the that. way, my sister-in-law, uh, who, is a, who is South Korean, yeah, we were texting back and forward. She was on our family group text. She was so proud of the team. I know. And she loves when they do well, and, and she loves her boy's son. But she did not understand. I mean, I got to talk to her, but she certainly didn't feel like they'd let the country this down. This was her. so weird. Yeah. Uh, my red card is... For Danny Murphy of the BBC for breaking the Steve McLaren rule. Uh, Let me just... So BBC do a match tracker and they have their um, pundits 
um, chiming in at different stages in the match and you can follow it on the BBC app and also online um, and it's it's a pretty good thing most most uh, websites have it um, this was at uh, English time 2054 quotes thoroughly deserved victory Danny Murphy former England midfielder and the only Spurs man former Spurs man to let himself down uh, today we have thoroughly deserved the victory we have not created a lot of chances but we have not we have had not to go into fifth or sixth gear. Oh, Danny. Danny, Danny, Danny. Have you learned nothing from two years ago? This is the Steve McLaren rule because Steve McLaren did this when Iceland equalised against England. It's been the perfect response. You'd think that, no problem, start again, keep dominating, keep getting uh, pressure on the Iceland back four. The only thing that they have got is the big boy up front, Sigurdsson, who really, Sig Thorsen, Oh, oh my words! My oh, tell us, talk us through that, Steve. I think we know what's happened, but talk us through it. Oh, just saying, Sig Thorson. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you could all see the look on this guy's face. Oh, please! I know I've told you this before. We've used that audio before. But go look it up, and it's just basically the Steve McLaren rule when when commentating or giving your views on England. Don't speak too soon so just what always be negative no just be cautious in everything you say certainly don't say we have thoroughly deserved the victory right before Yeri Mina equalises that is a thing that happened caught offside man of the match I give mine to Japan their fans have been noted for staying behind after games to help clean the stadiums including after the Belgium match in which you would have thought they'd make a beeline for the exits but the fans are not alone the players did the same. A picture was posted from the Japanese locker room following the Belgium match. It was immaculate. Uh, you honestly would not have thought that anyone used that room over the course of the, the previous couple hours. Uh, they also left a note behind with the word spasibo on it, which in Russian means thank you. Uh, pretty classy from a nation whose team made their country proud despite suffering one of the most difficult defeats of the tournament so far. Good for Japan. That's really good. Easy to root for when you, when you see stuff like that. Senegalese fan, J- Japanese fans in the stands, a lot of cleaning up at this World Cup. With very few exceptions, we haven't really heard much about rowdy, poor fan behavior. And remember, that was a major concern coming into this. And, I mean, there was some stuff with Serbia that came up during the Switzerland game, but you haven't really heard much else. Uh, my men of the match are, I suppose... It's more storylines than anything and what the World Cup throws up. So look at that amazing goal we spoke about from the French young star Pavard. Andrew, he's only had one full season in the top flight in German football. He started with Stuttgart when they were in Bundesliga 2. Look at that wonderful goal he scores. And the next minute, he's in the, the locker room after France have beaten Argentina, Messi's Argentina, and Didier Deschamps says to him, you remind me of Lillian Thuram from, from France 98. That was in a Julien Laurent piece on ESPN. That amazed me. Look at Kawashima, the goalkeeper for Japan. Double, amazing, that amazing double save. Um, I know he probably got it wrong on the, on the Vertonghen header, but whatever. He was relegated with Dundee United in 2016. Like, to come back to this big stage is huge. And look at even Nasser Chadley. Look at the way his career has gone the last few years. Relegated with West Brom this season. Mm-hmm. And popping up to score the winner in a round of 16 World Cup game. I'm just saying the World Cup allows players to write a different story to their career. A joyous story and something that will last forever. And we always talk about guys who are country over club. Thank God for international football. It kind of, it resurrects careers. It reincarnates players. It's just so amazing. And I think we've seen a lot of that at this tournament. Yeah, it has the power to make heroes out of nobodies. Right. Essentially. And uh, you've seen it time and time again, and it is one of the most fun things about this tournament. There's so much commercialism and all that, but ultimately, when you're watching this, I mean, these guys are just so clearly playing for pride. There's no – all that other stuff, that's not even a thought in the backs of their minds. And I think it just – it all comes across as a very – with all the FIFA nonsense and all that, it's still – when you're watching these players, it still just comes across as very genuine. It it, it feels that way, and you know what? It just seems like – you know when they say – Again, Champions League magazine voice. As a boy, I always dreamed of playing in the World Cup. When you see them on the field, you believe it. It's it's so true and it's so raw and it, it goes back to something in their youth. One thing, you were saying commercialism, our fans are so done with those Volkswagen ads. Oh, oh yeah. my word. 
Well, the tweets, it, we're getting tweets two, three a day about this. They especially become annoying when they're for teams that have already been eliminated. But the German one. Yeah. The Iceland one. Yeah. That might have been a swing and a miss by Volkswagen. Yeah, it wasn't good. Well, I'll tell you what. If you're still with us and you're hearing these words, you, you, my friend, are one of the heroes. Because this is an all-timer. This is like back to when we first started. We're going to have another one of these podcasts on Thursday. Thank you all so much for your iTunes reviews and for submitting your favorite moments from the round of 16. Please do so for the quarterfinals. We'll preview those games coming up on Thursday. Uh, It should be a lot of fun. Can I say happy 4th of July to everybody? I hope they enjoy listening to this on their long commutes. So it's going to come in handy. And also, I will tweet out a wonderful photo of me and Andrew watching a game at the weekend where there's almost a celestial, godlike light shining on Andrew. And also, Andrew catches a punt from me, which is amazing too. So I'll put both of those out on our Twitter. So uh, at CO Soccer Pod, if you want to see those real moments of Americana. (laughs) That's right. Hey. To you, I say. Take it later, fun boy. See ya. Take care. You've been listening to the Caught Offside Soccer Podcast. I just saved hundreds of dollars by switching to Geico. I feel like a whole new person. Disclaimer, you will not become a whole new person. This is impossible. You might be able to join a gym or diet program, buy a new wardrobe, get hair implants, but your DNA and physical form will remain the same. Geico waives any and all liability if you attempt to become a new person, except a cyborg. If you choose to become a half-human, half-cybernetic organism with lasers for eyes, the Geico legal team would be cool with that because, quote, laser eyes are pretty sweet. Pew, 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 end quote. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more.